What's happening, everybody? James Hancock here. Earlier today, I got into the New York Film Festival press screening for Martin Scorsese's long-awaited The Irishman, which will be released theatrically on November 1st and then on Netflix on November 27th. Since it's such a long window between now and the movie's release, I've decided to make this review spoiler-free, something I rarely do, and I'll either do a spoiler analysis of my podcast, Wrong Real, or a video closer to the movie's release. But if you're unfamiliar with the project, The Irishman is based on the memoir I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt, with an adaptation by screenwriter Steve Zalian. The story follows the life of Frank the Irishman Sheeran and the crimes he confessed to having committed while working for the Bufalina crime family, including the murder of one of the most notorious figures of the 20th century, Jimmy Hoffa. Using de-aging technology created by Industrial Light and Magic, Martin Scorsese was able to cast some of his most reliable and beloved collaborators from his legendary career, including Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Harvey Keitel. But just in case that's not in a star power for you, Scorsese finally got to work with the great Al Pacino, who plays none other than Jimmy Hoffa. I know some folks these days like to make fun of Al Pacino's, shall we say, exuberance in some of his recent movies, but I think this is his best performance that I've seen since the 90s, when he was working on movies like Carlito's Way in Heat. So much about this movie is going to make Scorsese's fans really happy. Obviously, anytime Scorsese tackles the crime genre or makes a gangster movie, it's an event. So many of his films are either about the criminal underworld or at least feature incredibly dynamic characters from that world. I'm talking about movies like Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, Casino, Gangs in New York, The Departed. If you like these movies, The Irishman is absolutely going to be right up your alley. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely love and adore Scorsese's work outside the crime genre as well. Movies like The Last Waltz, King of Comedy, After Hours, The Color of Money, Wolf of Wall Street, and so many more. Although I guess Wolf of Wall Street has one foot in both worlds because it is dealing with criminals, it's just not violent criminals. But I think we can all agree that material like The Irishman really plays to Scorsese's strengths as a filmmaker. Aiding him in this endeavor are two of his closest friends and allies, longtime editor Thelma Schoonmaker, who first worked with Scorsese way back in 1967 with Who's That Knocking at My Door? And we have composer Robbie Robertson, who I might love first and foremost from his time playing with the band, but he's also delivered some astonishing music to a ton of Scorsese movies over the years, in particular The Color of Money, probably the score closest in tone to what you'll hear in The Irishman. Now, it seems like all the chatter surrounding this movie has been about the de-aging process of the actors, so much so that I feel like it's almost eclipsed the meat of what this three-and-a-half-hour criminal epic is all about. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way so I can focus on the ingredients that I'm really interested in, style, drama, aesthetics, etc. We've seen a lot of de-aging in movies recently, particularly in the Marvel movies where guys like Michael Douglas and Robert Downey Jr. went through similar treatment. Also, it's well known that a lot of glamorous but aging movie stars these days enjoy a little subtle de-aging just to amp up their natural beauty. I have no problems at all with this technique. Actors have been disguising themselves with makeup and prosthetics ever since they first set foot on a stage, and this is just the latest iteration of that. The question is whether or not it's distracting in The Irishman, because a lot of the film is told out of sequence, there are abundant opportunities for the audience to do a direct compare and contrast between different ages, and I'll admit that for the first few minutes, I was definitely looking hard at De Niro's eyes and body language just to see if I was convinced. On a few occasions, the eyes did look a little dead and glassy, but I stopped noticing the eyes after a couple of minutes. What I never stopped noticing, however, was the body language. Robert De Niro, he's 76 years old. Let's just say he doesn't quite stomp someone's face in like he used to in movies like Goodfellas. Naturally, he's a little stiff at his age, so the scenes where he's resorting to brute strength instead of a gun might not have the same punch that you're looking for, but this is a really minor problem at worst that very seldom affects the film. At the press conference after the movie, Scorsese mentioned how the movie took so many years to get off the ground and to find the financing that the technology at ILM kept getting better and better, which ended up working to the movie's advantage because the actors weren't going to do the movie if they had to play these roles with a lot of elaborate technology all over them that might interfere with their ability to perform with each other. Because what really matters with this movie is the relationship between Frank Sheeran, Jimmy Hoffa, and Russell Bufalino, played by Joe Pesci, who's so good, never in a million years would you suspect that he's been on this incredibly lengthy hiatus bordering on retirement. The stakes of this drama couldn't be higher. As president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Union from 1957 to 1971, Jimmy Hoffa was one of the most powerful and corrupt people in the entire country, and in his own way as famous as the Beatles, all at a time where his friends in organized crime were busy manipulating presidential elections, building Las Vegas, and if you believe Frank Sheeran's memoir, playing a role in the killing of Kennedy for his failure to liberate Cuba so that the mob could move in and build even more casinos. In the middle of all of this, Frank is trying to serve two masters, both of whom are dear friends who are slowly but surely growing apart to the point where their interests are no longer in complete alignment. During the press conference, Scorsese described Frank's journey as the story of a moral conflict in a man who, from the point of view of the life that they are in, 
is a fundamentally good guy trying to do the right thing. The movie has tons of heart and can be incredibly moving at times, but don't worry, this is not some lurid melodrama. If violence is your thing, either the threat of violence or outright murder is imbued in every frame of film, almost comically so, creating a really satisfying atmosphere of gallows humor and dark comedy that had my theater howling, far more than I would have thought, in that so many critics these days tend to be overly sensitive and wag their fingers in disapproval at violence in movies. Then again, New York is Scorsese's hometown, and this is the biggest movie making its premiere at the New York Film Festival, so perhaps the room is just ready to relax and give themselves over to this story. The style and tone of the movie definitely makes it a far bigger crowd pleaser than Scorsese's previous movie, Silence. But I was worried going into the screening. Scorsese's pretty much said everything that can be said about organized crime at this point, not to mention the most three and a half hour movies about history run the risk of feeling stale, bloated, stiff, overly long, you name it. But The Irishman has the speed and the electricity of a really exciting TV show, making me wonder if the movie might have benefited from being a miniseries on Netflix instead of a feature. The great majority of the people who will see this movie will be seeing it on Netflix, and will have the ability to start and stop it at their leisure, and they might just decide to make a whole day out of watching this behemoth as if it were a TV show. What surprised me about Scorsese's approach, though, was his decision not to glamorize this tale as he did with Goodfellas and Casino, movies that are incredibly seductive in terms of the lifestyle they depict. The Wolf of Wall Street had that kind of sex appeal as well. This movie's primarily concerned with blue-collar guys and working stiffs who, for the most part, live like everyday Americans. Frank just so happens to have a very useful set of skills and a flexible moral code, which is a natural byproduct of his incredibly lengthy time serving in World War II, where he saw a lot more combat than the average soldier. He's used to taking orders, and Jimmy Hoffa and Russell Bufalino have no shortage of enemies that they need help with. What's interesting about the violence is how abrupt it can be. In Goodfellas, we enjoyed these long, lengthy scenes where we soaked in the view of dead men all to the tune of Eric Clapton. In The Irishman, Scorsese's approach to violence owes a lot to directors like Howard Hawks, where the violence comes out of nowhere, scares you half to death very abruptly, and is over almost as quickly as it began. But as violent as this movie can be, I was totally caught off guard by just how much time I spent howling in laughter. In particular, Al Pacino and his rivalry with Anthony Provenzano, played by Stephen Graham. Somehow Scorsese's managed to channel all of Al Pacino's insane, over-the-top energy and found for him the perfect vehicle where he can really cut loose, but he's still contained within a well-written role. At the press conference, Pacino kept talking about how he spent all this time on the set listening to Jimmy Hoffa's voice at all hours, and you can tell he was completely, totally invested. And there are many times where he kind of runs away with and steals the movie entirely. And after the show, Pacino was almost as amped up as Scorsese, telling all these stories, and you could tell that the two of them were overjoyed to finally work together after all these decades. Pesci, on the other hand, was eerily quiet. But when he was willing to speak, he brought the house down with these quick, almost dismissive answers. But the cast all around in this movie deserves really high marks. Ray Romano, Bobby Cannavale, Jim Norton, Anna Paquin, Jesse Plemons. The cast is just first rate. Keitel, I wouldn't have minded seeing him with a little bit more screen time, but I was just thrilled to see him in the lineup. So in closing, I just want to emphasize how much this movie means to me on a personal level. During college in the late 90s, movies really got their hooks into me, and the movies that acted as the catalyst were those starring Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, and more often than not, directed by filmmakers like Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, and Brian De Palma. The first two Godfathers, Scarface, Carlito's Way, Mean Streets, Goodfellas, my friends and I watched them over and over and over, and when Heat hit the big screen and gave us the first movie, where Pacino and De Niro shared the screen at the same time, Time, it was like Christmas, the Super Bowl, and the 4th of July all rolled into one. So to see Scorsese, De Niro, and Pacino all in their 70s now still delivering such an exciting movie experience, I find it all to be incredibly inspiring. Creatively, they all still have so much to offer. On the set, in spite of almost no rehearsal time, apparently Joe Pesci and Al Pacino were masters at improvising lines that were perfectly faithful to their characters as written. Ordinarily, I'm not a big fan of improvisation, but I think a lot of the humor in this movie comes from this flexibility on the set. Steven Zellian is a damn good screenwriter, but he can be very earnest and very serious in, in the types of movies that he writes, unlike writers like Nicholas Pileggi, who wrote Goodfellas. But in the end, this movie was a true dream project for Scorsese and De Niro, who claim they mostly made it for themselves. Scorsese spoke very movingly about how friends and collaborators, they can grow in different ways and they often grow apart, but the mutual love of this project 
kept coming back to them. And finally, we have the ninth collaboration between Scorsese and De Niro to enjoy. Of all the great actor-director duos you can think of in history from John Ford and John Wayne or Toshir Mifune and Akira Kurosawa or Werner Herzog and Klaus Kinski or Liv Ullman and Ingmar Bergman, I think it's abundantly clear at this point that Scorsese and De Niro are going to go down in history as one of the best director-actor duos in the history of the business. So I think that's all I have for now. If I go any longer, I'm going to be tempted to veer over into spoiler territory. If you want the deep dive with every little morsel, I will be discussing this movie in much greater detail on my podcast, Wrong Real. And there's a link in the description below to my podcast. There's also a link to buy Wrong Real gear if you want to drink coffee like a champ. In any event, if you want to talk more about Scorsese or gangster movies of the New York Film Festival or anything, you can always find me on Twitter at Colbrax. But if you enjoyed this review, please consider hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel. That's very helpful to me. But hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks so much for watching my video. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.